is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. On this Martin Luther King Day, the day before the inauguration of America's first African-American president, we hear from a leader of the civil rights movement who risked his life marching for the right of African-Americans to vote. From 1963 to 66, John Lewis chaired the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mobilizing students to protest against segregation and for voting rights. He was a leader of the now famous voting rights march from Selma to Montgomery, which ended soon after it started when Alabama state troopers attacked the demonstrators on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma in what became known as Bloody Sunday. Lewis was a close associate of Martin Luther King. He was the youngest speaker at the 1963 March on Washington, which ended with King's I Have a Dream speech. Since 1987, Lewis has served in Congress, representing Georgia's 5th District, which includes Atlanta. He recorded our conversation from his office. He told me he grew up in Alabama at a time when there was one county whose population was 80% African American, but there wasn't a single registered black voter. Congressman Lewis, welcome to Fresh Air, and thank you so much for joining us. When you were a young man, were you ever challenged at the polls? Did you have a hard time registering, or did anyone ever try to prevent you from voting? When I was growing up in rural Alabama, uh, it was impossible for me to register to vote. I didn't become a registered voter until I moved to Tennessee, to Nashville, as a student. Why was it impossible? Black men and women were not allowed to register to vote. My own mother, my own father, my grandfather, and my uncles and aunts uh, could not register to vote because each time they attempted to register to vote, they were told they could not pass the literacy test. And many people were so intimidated, so afraid that they would lose their jobs, they would be evicted from the farms, and they just they almost gave up. Your parents and, were sharecroppers. No. Uh, you, my you, you mother and father and many of my relatives had been sharecroppers. They had been tenant farmers, like so many people in the South. They knew the stories that had occurred. They knew places in Alabama where people were evicted from the farm, from the plantation. They, they read about, they heard about incidents in Tennessee where people were evicted from the farms and the plantation uh, back in 1956, in 1957, in West Tennessee between Nashville and Memphis, Tennessee. Now, because of that, did you did your parents tell you not to bother to try to vote because it would be dangerous, they might lose their farm? I mean, you're, you, were, you were educated. You could certainly pass the literacy test. My, my parents told me in the very beginning as a young child, and I raised the question about segregation and racial discrimination, they told me not to get in the way, not to get in trouble, uh, not to make any noise. But we had people that were educated. We had teachers. We had high school principals. We, we had people teaching in colleges and university in Tuskegee, Alabama. But they were told they failed the so-called literacy test. So did you go to the registration place and try to register, or did you not even bother? Well, I didn't bother mm -hmm. uh, in Alabama. Uh, I didn't uh, seek to get registered until I moved to Tennessee. One of the more dramatic moments of the Civil Rights Movement was a march that you helped lead in 1965 of about 600 people. The march was supposed to be from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, demanding voting rights, but the marchers were stopped soon after you started marching, and you were beaten by the police. Would you talk first a little bit about the goal of that march? In, in 1965, the attempted march from Selma to Montgomery on March 7 was planned to dramatize to the state of Alabama and to the nation that people of color wanted to register to vote. In Selma, you can only attempt to register to vote on the first and third Mondays of each month. You had to go down to the courthouse and get a copy of the so-called literacy test and attempt to pass the test. And people stood in line day in and day out, failing to get a copy of the test or failing to uh, pass the test. So after several hundred people had been arrested and people had been beaten and one young man had been shot and killed, we decided to march. And on Sunday afternoon, March 7th, 
about 600 of us left a little church called Brown Chapel AME Church and started walking in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion through the streets of Selma. We were walking in twos, no one saying a word. We came to the edge of the bridge, crossing the Alabama River. We continued to walk. We came to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Down below, we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. And we kept walking, and we came within hearing distance of the State Troopers. And a man identified himself and said, I am Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. This is an unlawful march. It would not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your church. In less than a minute and a half, the major said, troopers advance. And you saw these men putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with bull whips, nightsticks, driven us with horses, and releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. I had a concussion there at the bridge. And almost 44 years later, I don't recall how I made it back across that bridge through the streets of Salma. But I do recall being back at the church that Sunday afternoon. The church is full to capacity, more than 2,000 people on the outside. And someone said to me, John says something to the audience. Speak to them. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it, how President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam, but cannot send troops to Selma, Alabama, to protect people who only desire to register to vote. What was the impact, do you think, of that march on the actual passage of the Voting Rights Act? The march created a sense of righteous indignation among the American people. When they saw the photographs, when they read the stories, when they heard the news on the radio, watched it on television, they didn't like it. A few days after Bloody Sunday, there was demonstration in more than 80 American cities. At the White House, at the Department of Justice, people were demanding that the government act. President Johnson didn't like what he saw he called Governor Wallace, the governor of Alabama at the time, to come to Washington and try to get assurance from the governor that he would be able to protect us if we decided to march again. The governor could not assure the president. So President Johnson federalized the Alabama National Guard, called out part of the United States military. And eight days after Bloody Sunday, President Lyndon Johnson spoke to a joint session of the Congress and made one of the most meaningful speeches any American president had made in modern time on the whole question of voting rights and introduced the Voting Rights Act. And I was sitting in a home in Selma, Alabama that evening when President Johnson spoke to the nation and spoke to the Congress, sitting with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And at one point in the speech before Dr. before President Johnson rather, Concluded the speech, he said, and we shall overcome, and we shall overcome. I looked at Dr. King, tears came down his face, and we all cried a little to hear President Johnson say, and we shall overcome. And he said to me and to others in the room, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery, and the Voting Rights Act will be passed. Finally, Two weeks after Bloody Sunday, we started on the third effort to make it from Selma to Montgomery. And 300 of us marched all of the, of the way, but by the time we walked into Montgomery, there were more than 25,000 citizens. And that effort led the Congress to debate the Voting Rights Act and passed that act, and President Johnson signed it into law in August of 1965. Can you talk a little bit about how your mindset changed to go from what your parents told you, which was, don't make trouble, it's too risky, 
to making a lot of trouble, to leading marches, to be willing to get beaten on the head and knocked unconscious to stand up for what you thought was right. But growing up, I, I, I saw segregation. I saw racial dis- discrimination. I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, and I didn't like it. I would ask my mother and ask my parents over and over again, why? And they said, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. I, I was so inspired by Rosa Parks. In 1955, I was 15 years old. I was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. I heard his words on an old radio and seemed like he was saying to me, John Lewis, you too can make a contribution. What, you, what, what was he saying on the radio? Uh, he, he was saying was that we must not just be concerned. Was it a sermon or a speech? It, it was a speech, but also uh, a sermon. He was speaking at a church in Montgomery. And he was saying, in effect, that we must not just be concerned about the pearly gates and the streets with milk and honey. We have to be concerned about the streets of Montgomery and the doors of Woolworth, that we had to be concerned about jobs, about blacks working at, as cashiers, of people being able to try on clothing and bring down those signs. And I said to myself, if I ever got a chance, to strike a blow against segregation and racial discrimination. I'm gonna play my part, I'm gonna do my part. I was so inspired by Dr. King that in 1956 with some of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, I was only 16 years old. We went down to the public library trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. It was a public library. I never went back to that public library until July 5th, 1998, by this time I'm in the Congress, for a book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind. Yeah, your memoir. And they gave me a library card after the program was over. And I, I was inspired. I, I studied the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence in Nashville as a student. And I started sitting in in the fall of 1959, and got arrested the first time in February 1960. Now, you described the, the difficulty your parents had accepting the risks that you were taking as a civil rights activist. As an activist, did you find it was difficult to convince the older generation to, to join up with the movement? Was it easier to convince younger people than older people? It was much easier to convince younger people, uh, to convince students, whether they were high school or college students. In the South during that period, there was so much fear. There were people that were afraid to be afraid. But there were others who said, when we held the mass meetings, the rallies, the voter registration workshop in the church, it was just feeling, well, it's taking place in the church. It must be okay. It must be all right. There was ministers, religious leaders, that was afraid to say anything from their pulpits. Because they thought, for good reason, the church could be burned down, could be bombed. So we had to do a lot of convincing. And we would go into the fields where people were working in the fields and try to convince some of the field workers. We'd go in the beauty shop, the barber shops, a knock on the doors of people's homes, trying to get them to become participants, to get involved, to come to a rally, come to a mass meeting. Give me a sense of what you'd say. We would say to people, you know, you've been living here for 40 years, for 50 years. Your street is not paved. You have a dirt road. You don't have clean water. If you want to change that, you must register and you must vote, you can get someone else elected. Come to a mass meeting. Come next Monday. Your neighbors are coming. Your uncle is coming. Your children are coming. You should be there. I tell people we're going to have a march for the right to vote. Don't be afraid. You may get arrested, but a lot of other people will be getting arrested with you. And some people will be convinced, and some will not. 
On this Martin Luther King Day, I'd love to hear the story of how you first met Reverend King. In 1957, when I finished high school, I was 17 years old. This was two years after the Montgomery bus boycott, two years after Rosa Parks had taken her seat, and Dr. King had emerged as a national leader. I wanted to attend a little college about 10 miles from my home, it's all white state college. I submitted my high school application. I never heard a word from the college. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I didn't tell my mother, my father. Dr. King wrote me back, sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to see him. In the meantime, I had been accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee. So in September 1957, I went off to school to Nashville. And after being there for two weeks, I told one of my teachers that I had been in contact with Dr. King. This teacher informed Dr. King that I was in school in Nashville. So Martin Luther King Jr. got back in church with me and suggested when I was home from spring break to come and see him. So my father drove me to the Greyhound bus station I boarded the bus to travel from Troy to Montgomery. And a young lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, who was the lawyer for Rosa Parks, for Dr. King and the Montgomery Movement, met me at the Greyhound bus station and drove me to the First Baptist Church and ushered me into the office of the church. I saw Martin Luther King Jr. standing behind a desk. I was so scared, I didn't know what to say or what to do. And Dr. King spoke up and said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. And that was my meeting of Martin Luther King Jr. So what did he do? Did he, did he try to encourage you to keep, keep trying to get into that? white college? Uh, or did he say, forget college, just come join the movement, work with No, me. Martin Luther King Jr. said to me, we want to help. If you want to go to Troy State, we will help you. We would hire Fred Gray as the lawyer to file a suit against Troy State. But he went on to say, if you really pursue this effort, your family home can be bombed or burned down. They could lose their jobs. You may be beaten. Things could happen to you, but you must be willing to do it. And I told him I was willing to do it. But he said, you must go home and talk to your mother and talk to your father and get them to be willing to file the suit. So that afternoon, I went back to Troy, Alabama, met with my mother, met with my father, told them about the discussion I had with Dr. King. And they were so scared, they were so frightened, they didn't want to have anything to do with me pursuing my effort to enter Troy State College. So I continued to study in Nashville. And did other things in the Civil Rights Movement instead? Well, I continued the sit-ins, got on the Freedom Rides, and became an active participant, not just in Nashville, but throughout the American South. What impact did his assassination have on you? The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. made me a very, very sad, and I mourned and I cried like millions of our citizens did. Matter of fact, when I heard that he was that he had been assassinated, I was with Robert Kennedy in Indianapolis, Indiana, campaigning with him. But somehow I said to myself, I'm not going to become bitter or hostile. I'm not going to give up or give in. I threw myself more into that campaign and I made a commitment to myself that I will do what I can to continue 
the work of Dr. King and later until Bobby Kennedy was assassinated two months later to continue uh, his effort to make our country a more just and more fair country. Do you think that there have been instances where the African-American vote has been suppressed in recent years in spite of the Voting Rights Act? There have been efforts in recent years and as recently as this past election, but have been a deliberate and systematic attempt to suppress the African-American vote. We had a case in some parts of Virginia where people tried to say to African-Americans, uh, to uh, would-be Democratic voters, you're not supposed to vote on Tuesday, uh, November 4th. Uh, you're supposed to uh, vote on Wednesday, November the 5th. Uh, they were saying, in effect, that there's going to be such a big turnout, such a massive turnout, and you don't want to stand in these long lines. This is not necessarily a state, uh, a political party doing it, but it's individuals. And there have been cases where people go to the polls, planning to vote, waiting in line, and you see people standing, taking names, or taking the license plates on cars, of how law enforcement people standing nearby and are telling people that if you go and attempt to vote, you cannot vote because you owe a bill, you haven't paid your taxes. And people are intimidated, they're harassed. I want to quote something.